Right now, I'm privileged to introduce our speaker for today, Stacy Adams. Thank you, Karen. Can everyone hear me okay? No. No? Yes? Yeah. I'm not used to a real mic. I use a Britney Spears mic usually where it's headset. Do you think to? Try. I can try. So, it's Saturday and you're on a lecture. You're just cool as me. <laughs> so thanks for coming. But you could be doing anything else if you're here with us today. So thank you very, very much for taking the time to learn more about Hollywood, and Hollywood in the 80s, more importantly. This talk is titled From Sand Spurs to Sportatorium, and I do want to take a moment to thank Joan Michelson in the back. Thank you, Joan. Because this title would not be it's a, the title if it wasn't for her. It's a great title, so thank you for recommending it. Uh, sand spurs, if you'll, those of you that don't know what a sand spur is, it's this little guy that would get stuck on our feet when we're running around in Hollywood. It's, it's a sticker. That's what a sand spur is. So, um, and here, of course, is the Sportatorium. And I'll talk with you a lot more about what the Sportatorium was. It is no longer, sadly, but in a nutshell, it was a concert venue, to say the least. A place of ill repute, many things. <laughs> So as Karen, Karen mentioned, um, I am Stacy Adams, Hollywood Historical Society board member, lover of local history. But who do I think I am that I'm speaking about this subject matter, right? People look at me, they're like, are you giving a talk on this? What do you think you are? Well, I'm an expert on history and rock and roll because I was conceived at a bicentennial concert at Tampa Stadium. So that makes me, by nature, an expert. Thank you, Mom. Very much for that. Who was singing? Uh, Loggins and Messina, yes. Fleetwood Mac, yes. the Eagles. Yes. <laughs> So this is my history, this is my nostalgia, and I think it's a lot of yours, too. I mean, it's not way far back. When you think of history, you think, you know, Aztecs, Mayans, the Renaissance. I mean, this isn't too long ago, but it's no longer with us, a lot of this stuff. But it's stuff that we remember, stuff that we consider our history. So it's history. It's, it's our history. So I want you to take the time to think about where you were when these things happened, when these events happened, because it's, it's your history too. Now, when I put this together, we're gonna be here together for about 50 minutes, an hour or so. When I did my first dry runs on this baby, it was three and a half hours. <laughs> three and a half hours. So there's a lot of stuff I'm gonna miss that hopefully we can get together again and talk about. But forgive me, I know we're missing a lot of things, but we'll be back, we'll talk about them. So, come with me down memory lane. Let's talk about Hollywood, spark some memories. Now, once my clicker works, if it works, talk to me, clicker. You know, you have to have a technical difficulty or it's not, it's not a party. This is where you need your little Britney Spears headset. I know. Yeah. All right, I'm just gonna like unplug and plug again. Who's the IT guy? He knows it's there and it worked this far before. Sorry, I stopped. <laughs> Stephen will edit. He can edit. I know that it worked before, don't do this to me. Oh, guys. No. Huh? You need somebody to move the slides? Well, I don't know if somebody will be, will someone be blocking if they're sitting there, Isa? No. no. Girls? <laughs> All right. I'm so shocked. I'm so sorry. I can't believe it's not working. Speaker. Let me see that speaker. I think that thing. Oh, this is the best seat in the house. You know? <laughs> Secretly glad. All right. Yeah, I'm number two. All right. <laughs> Let's see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. so okay. Thanks, Karen. Is that you, Karen, or me? I think that was. You want to try it again? Oh, Good. all right. Do Carol Lewis, Sir Gillis, everyone. <laughs> all right. 
right, guys. So, I grew up in West Hollywood. My mom, mom, thank you, she drove me through the Seminole Reservation, took me to alligator wrestling shows, so she got me hooked on history really early, teaching me along the way. And all of my life has been in Broward County. All of my life. I've never lived anywhere else. I've never worked anywhere else. I've never studied anywhere else. Well, FAU here and there, but it's, it's close enough. It's on the line. <laughs> Everything's been in Broward. I'm a Broward girl. I'm a Florida girl. And um, through all that, I became a history buff. I um, became hooked on history in elementary school. I studied history in college. And I, along the way, became someone who really missed it. You know, my profession isn't history. So I heard about this thing called the Hollywood Historical <laughs> Society. Got hooked, became a member. They were looking for a newsletter editor. Became a board member after that. Held some posts after that. And it's been since 2003 I've been a member. And I love it. And I will never leave. And I'm joining again, Karen. Thank you. I forgot to respond to that email. <laughs> I'll never leave. <laughs> so I just love this city. I love it so much. Um, I live in West Pembroke Pines now. For those of you who aren't familiar with West Pembroke Pines, it is um, west of A1A, it's west of US-1. <laughs> it's west of I-95. West of 441, it's west of University. It's west of Flamingo. It's west of I-75. Oh my God. But I'm not past US-27. <laughs> but I am one light east of US-27. So we're far. We're really, really far. We're kind of where the alligators are. But we love it out there. But the strange thing is, is my husband and I, we keep coming out this way. And we have family out here, we have friends out here. Gino's and Mimi's are out here. So <laughs> we pack the cooler, we make the 40 minute haul, we come out to Hollywood. Everything's in Hollywood, we love Hollywood. And this is my love letter to the city, as you'll see. Uh, on your way out, if you'd like, I have along the tables here, a lot of things I've collected over time. Just some silly things I've collected as a kid, as a teenager, that really have a reflection of the city. So you'll kind of have some memories yourself on that. Now, what to expect today? Here's my warning. We're going to leave Hollywood every now and then. We might go to Davie, we might go to Hollandale, we might go to Pines. So please don't torture me if we leave Hollywood for two seconds. We might do that. We might skirt the timeline too. We might go into like late 70s, early 90s. And this is an uncensored history. This is a bad lecture. <laughs> some topics are going to be controversial. Some are going to be somber. But they are our history in Hollywood. So they're important to our citizens. They impacted our city. So that's very important. And we do need to cover them. Uh, some topics are going to be fun. So share your reactions. Share your memories. Who would holler clap when you see that place that you miss and you're excited about? So let's go. We're going to go from the beach to the Everglades. This is our agenda, guys. Crabs to the gators, east to west. That's how we're going to flow. So to get started, let's go to the beach. We're going to start with the Diplomat. Now, the Diplomat Hotel goes all the way back to 1958. Back in 58, it was the only hotel between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Can you imagine that? The only hotel between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Uh, it's on A1A, just north of Hollandale Beach Boulevard. And I found this really neat advertisement from 1962 that I'd love to show you right now. Technical difficulties pending. Let's see if it works. Everybody loves Florida during every season. But it's a very special treat for children when mom and dad can take them along on vacations in the Sunshine State. Especially since many outstanding resorts, such as the Diplomat Hotel and Country Club, have complete, supervised children's activities for all ages. In addition, many resort hotels offer reduced rates for children, usually when occupying the same room with parents. Now, this is a healthy boost for the family vacation budget. With all the advantage of resort service, for children, the big thing is getting into that swimming pool. Just 
marching around, there are such extras as swimming lessons to help a child develop speed and coordination in the water. Ah, that sunshine. When children are being well cared for, parents find time to really relax. <laughs> Very nice, huh? That was the diplomat. Quite the place in the 60s and then through the 70s, 80s. Fun for the whole family, as you can see, and I know it certainly was for me too. I have a lot of good memories of being in the diplomat with my family, mostly babysitting gigs that I did. Um, mostly for Doc Martin shoes, I remember doing those as well. So here in the 90s, it was worth it. But the diplomat was um, a fun, fun place. It was also fun for the whole nation. I have um, this neat shot. I hope you can see it. It's not a close one, but remember Hollywood Squares? Oh, Hollywood Squares. And if you're a real Hollywood Squares fan, you know in those squares you have to have either Shadow Stevens or Jim J. Bullock. You have to have one of those two in there. And this is on Diplomat Grounds in Hollywood. This was filmed. Uh, we also had a lot of other game shows filmed at the Diplomat, including Wheel of Fortune, the Miss Florida pageant had a lot of events there as well. Uh, but sadly, in 1998, the main building <coughs> went away, as well as access to my clicker. OK, there it is. Yes, it was demolished in 1998. I remember this happening because I was in college, and I skipped class to watch this. I knew it was happening. It was on local TV, and I was very excited about it, so I had to see it. Very exciting. Uh, it was rebuilt, bigger, better, beautiful as the Westin in 2002, and recently rebranded in 2014 as the Hilton. And it has a speakeasy there now with a, a hidden karaoke bar. So if anyone's interested in to see me after this, I want to <laughs> check that out. It sounds like fun. So still staying along the beach, let's take a ride to Ocean Walk. Anybody remember Ocean Walk? Yes. Still there, but not as quite as cool as it was in its heyday. Uh, that's a little further north, just adjacent to the Hollywood Beach Resort. Um, both of them, unfortunately, are not in a great state right now. Ocean Walk Mall opened in 1988, and it was up for sale by 1989. <laughs> One year. One year somebody figured a mall on the beach probably wasn't a great idea. It wasn't going to work out. But this place was really cool. This is where we hung out when we were kids. I mean, it had a pizza joint, it had an arcade. You're, this should be a drinking game. If you hear me say arcade, just, I'm gonna say arcade a lot in this whole presentation, so forgive me up front. It had a movie theater, it was along the beach, it was along the broadwalk. It was no, the best place to have a date night, to hang out with your friends. Um, and back then, the movie theater was $10. That was a lot of money. A lot of money to go to the movies back then. But Ocean Walk was really um, just, it had everything. It's still there, as you can see um, by these very, very recent pictures. Kara's here, who almost did my clicking. Thank you. She took these recently. And it still says Ocean Walk, I mean, along those buildings there. Mostly abandoned, has some office space, and probably won't be with us a whole lot longer. Ron, my husband, and I were just there but last week. Yeah. yeah. So, good memories, good memories. All right, guys, let's take a little bit of a trip back down south. All right, it's post time. That's what that means. We're at Gulfstream Park. Now, Gulfstream goes way back to 1939, way back. It's in Hollandale, so we're inching a little bit outside of Hollywood. And most famous, of course, for its horse racing. And of course, wonderful memories I have watching horse races with my family, <coughs> getting that racing form, picking out a cute horse name, you know, asking for a couple of bucks, losing it, just you know, you know, you know what you're doing, you just you like the name of the horse. But it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun going to Gulfstream. And um, also known for having the Broward County Fair. Now, this is a very mixed memory for me, as it might be for some of you. Uh, because on November 23rd, 1988, uh, Cooper City resident Christy Shafell, she lost her life that night as a result of a ride malfunction. 
Uh, we were there that night, some family and friends of mine, and I do remember the ambulance just hauling down the gangway trying to get to the scene of that accident. I was 11. I did this presentation just a few weeks ago and somebody was in it that um, knew Christy, was a neighbor of hers, and uh, you know lives near her where she grew up as well. And there's a park near where she grew up um, named in her honor, near um, Paul, yeah, Palm and Griffin in Cooper City. And it's, it's lovely. And after that, the fair bounced around, has some other locations. But it's back there now. They still have the Broward County Fair there now. And a lot of other things at Gulfstream, as we know, it's huge. Choo-choo, yep. <laughs> Got the casino. It's a dining mecca, shopping. If you're really organized, it's got the only container store in Broward County, so that's a big deal. Container store, oh my gosh, love it. It's the only place where you can get a little piece of plastic that's just for gravy packets. That's what it's for, that's what it says. It's amazing. And um, the fair's still there, so check it out. It's 1939, it's um, quite a Hollywood Hollandale staple for sure. Oh, remember this? Oh, I love this place. I love this place. <laughs> uh, the Dry Bread Christmas House. This was on 29th and Tap, <coughs> near I-95. So if you were driving along I-95 and you looked down, you could see. You could see the, this house. It looked just like this. It was, I mean, I know now we have people that go nuts. But back in 1976 to 1989, this was a really, really big deal. They used 130,000 lights, the dry breads, Don and Jackie dry bread. They decorated their home. Um, they had this great empty space near their house where people could come and visit, park their car, and really couldn't be really a nuisance to the neighbors because they had all this extra space. Well, lo and behold, enter, I think it was the, the state. They needed that land now because now we need to expand I-95. So the dry breads, being courteous, stopped doing it, looked for another location, which um, we'll talk about in a minute where they moved to. Uh, but they uh, do find another location. Now, a cool piece of trivia that I found that I didn't know, shamefully, uh, Jackie has a really cool maiden name. Does anybody know what that is? Jackie Siciliano dry bread. Uh, <laughs> ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, frozen custard along 441 and oh, yeah. Hollywood Boulevard, yeah. Yeah, um, Jackie's parents founded Sub Center and Siciliano's. So they, uh, they're a nice um, find a nice family for Hollywood for sure. That's the dry bread. So moving from one bread to another. <laughs> Let's go to the, the bread building in Young Circle. Now this is a view from Young Circle. Young Circle, I'm very proud to say, is named for Joseph W. Young, Hollywood's founder. There is um, a statue of Joseph W. Young. A lot of people are surprised to hear Young Circle is actually named after a guy. That's our founder, that's Joseph W. Young. And the circle goes way back, it goes back to the 20s. It's on US 1, Hollywood Boulevard. And it's just this wonderful, large park space for all of us to enjoy, uh, to hang out, have events, concerts, music, food trucks. <laughs> Everybody's. Everybody's, yes, you got it. <laughs> and overlooking uh, the park is the bread building. Most of us, can't, then you can't miss the bread building. Everybody knows Hollywood bread building. Now, again, didn't know this. Uh, the bread building housed the Hollywood Bread Company, which was a subsidiary of Wonder Bread from the 50s through the 90s. Hollywood bread is from the 50s through the 90s. And they were very famous for producing reduced calorie bread, which was this new fandangled thing back then. Now you get it anywhere, all kinds of places. I was very fortunate to find an advertisement. I think it goes back to the 70s. It feels like a 70s ad. But before I play it, I want you to notice in the lettering of the bread building, the L's and the Y, how they're kind of curvy. Just keep that lettering and that font in mind as you review this commercial. Hollywood light and Hollywood dark. Special formula, thinly 
sliced. Eight great vegetable flowers, no shortening. The taste is beautiful. Eleanor Hansberry's recipe booklet free. Where you buy beautiful Hollywood bread. All right, that's Hollywood bread for you. <laughs> Now, the red building, as far as I can see, it's, it seems for sale, unoccupied, just feels... It's so it's empty. Yeah, okay. They're going to use it for something. Condos? They're 19 stories. Okay, yeah. A business owns the whole part except for the home building. Okay. And they want to develop that. Thank you. All right. So if you guys haven't seen this yet, pass it, take a picture of it. It's just a tonight. It's gonna be history. It's gonna be history. <laughs> now we're on the boulevard, so I'd like to take a little bit of a cruise down west. But before I do that, I have a trivia question for you. What music group sold over one million albums and had an obscenity investigation launched on that album? Mm. All right. Two live crew. Two live crew. Two live crew. Very good. Here's where it gets a little controversial, folks. All right. All right. So here's a headline from the Miami Herald. On June 6, 1990, and keep in mind the days, I'm being specific with days for a reason, June 6, this album was ruled obscene, meaning that songs cannot be provided to the public sold or performed, whether to minors or adults. So why am I bringing this up in a Hollywood lecture? Well, on June 9th, that's only three days later, there was an incident, there was a concert, there was a performance with two live crew at Club Futura at 2100 on the <laughs> This is just west, west of Dixie, Dixie Highway, um, again, 21 and Hollywood Boulevard. So they had that concert, they had their good time. That night they leave, it's 3 a.m., it's June 10th. 12 police cars are following the band members as they're leaving Futura, and they're heading west. And they get pulled over and they get arrested at City Hall. <laughs> Where? Right here. <laughs> this is the scene of the crime. We're all here. Where two live crew gets arrested, right? Where you are right now. Well, by the way, two years later they get acquitted of all these obscenity charges. But I'm bringing it up because it's pretty interesting because this label that we know today stems from this incident because it launches this parental advisory label and the very first album to bear this label becomes two live crew's next album banned in the USA, which is in July, just that next month. Now, Futura closed in 1990. Um, I believe it was Gemini thereafter. I remember seeing that. I couldn't find any written research, but I know I saw it. And um, there's condos in that area now, of course. But it's pretty interesting that this is something that was um, right here in Hollywood. And there it is, City Hall, guys, right here, right where we're at. <laughs> and there's the, uh, the history of Hollywood. Now, uh, let's cool down and go to Six Flags. Remember Six Flags? Oh, yeah. This is a shot of the wave pool over at Six Flags Atlantis. Went through many names, many incarnations. Six Flags Atlantis, then it was just Six Flags, then it was Atlantis, Atlantis the Water Kingdom, so many things. Uh, but Six Flags, um, again, we're skirting a little bit outside of Hollywood. Um, I-95 in Sterling. Just, it's just east of Penn Dutch. So if you're at Penn Dutch and you're standing in that parking lot, you look over at 95, you're looking at Six Flags. And I'm saying that because that's what I always did when mom was shopping. <laughs> just, can I wait in the parking lot and look at Six Flags? Watch everybody on the rides. And uh, this was a cool place. It was a water park, of course. Had neat water slides, this great wave pool. Had an arcade, there you go. Uh, had some rides later on, and it was around for a pretty long time, 82 to 92. And one of the best memories I have is, I don't know why we did this, we would go to Publix, buy the cans of Coke, open them up in the parking lot, pour them out, and then take them to the admission booth, and, and then 
Get, get the discount. I don't know how much the Coke was versus the discount. I was just wondering, like, if that was worth it? I hope so, right? <laughs> it was still fun to do. It probably was like five bucks or something good enough, right? right yes. Yeah. <laughs> so at Six Flags now, does anybody know what Six, what Six Flags became? That area? Oakland. 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 Yep, Oakland Plaza. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get real nuts and know the exact location of the wave pool, it's Kmart. <laughs> Stand in linens, you're right at the drain or something. <laughs> Here's some neat construction photos. There's the wave pool being kind of raked out. There's some um, the earth being just, you know, kind of raked out. Penn Dutch is probably right around here, of course. Not built out yet, still got the land here. Miami's over here. East is over here. No track, no great observation. <laughs> a little bit more of a progression shot here. You see the concrete laid out here for the wave pool. Probably some of the pools or hot tubs out here. And you kind of see a little hill taking place up here for what's going to be the towers for the water slides. And look at this. Wow, yeah, good traffic. Yeah. <laughs> pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So a staple of any Hollywood kid, the mall. Oh yeah, love the mall, good. Okay, so I have a feeling you all know where the mall used to be. It's where Target. Hey, hey, we object. We think it's still a mall. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> and if you want family, we call it the old mall. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's right. Center, which was the new mall. <laughs> yes, we love it. Yes, I know. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So yeah, on um, North Park Road and Hollywood Boulevard, and again, to get real technical, if you guys want to kind of map it, if you're not completely familiar with Hollywood, it's around 30th, um, 30th, and, North, and, 30th and North Park Road. Uh, that is where the Hollywood Mall was. Not to be confused with the Hollywood Fashion Center, the newer mall. Thank you, yes. And the Hollywood Mall goes back to 1964. Now, this was get this, all right, in 1964, the first enclosed air-conditioned mall with a department store in South Florida. Oh, I didn't know that. AC. My mom worked there. AC, 1960, and a big store being Sears, so the nice big anchor store. And uh, had, a, had some nice stores in there, you know, fashion, fashion center, you know, of course, a new mall up and coming, gets all the better new fandangled, but it had top. Hmm? Jewelry store. Yeah. Oh, that one's still there. Nice, yes, it Jewelry is. store is still there, yeah. My mom oh, was there. Good, good, good memories. I remember um, Tom McCann, yes. love that shoe store. The Woolworth luncheon. Woolworths. Yes. Woolworths. Yeah, Woolworths. And um, a personal favorite of mine and my husband Ron, Bob's newsstand. <laughs> Bob's newsstand, okay? Now, for um, those of you that aren't completely familiar, and especially for those of you that are um, pretty um, new to Hollywood and even um, a maybe a younger generation, Bob's newsstand was. The place where you went to find out information on anything. They had magazines from all over the world that came in frequently, and it was just pre-internet. It was the best thing in the world. And whoever worked at Bob's Newsstand never bothers you. You could sit there for stand there, sit not sit there. You'd stand there for hours and just you can peruse through any magazine. So it was a, a really neat place. Uh, Hollywood Mall. They closed in '92, mostly because they really just couldn't compete with those bigger mall openings that were starting to happen. Uh, Galleria opened in 80, Aventura opened in 83, Sawgrass Mills, 90, forget it, Sawgrass Mills. Uh, but Pembroke Lakes opened in 92, and Sears, they moved out there, their anchor left them. Uh, plus, a very serious crime was committed here at the Hollywood Mall. Uh, the story did go nationwide, and most of you, of course, remember what happened. And if you do not, here is um, a one-minute video of what happened. Through the parents of Adam Walsh, who's been missing since yesterday noon from the Hollywood Sears Mall on Hollywood Boulevard. Six and a half years. Reve Walsh. We'd appreciate anyone with any information about him or have seen him or think they saw him to please call the Hollywood police.
I am prepared to offer a substantial reward for any information leading to the safe uh, uh, giving up of Adam. And to any of the people out there that might be holding Adam, we are prepared to negotiate ourselves with them for a safe release of Adam. Police were baffled. How could a little boy disappear from a crowded store in the middle of the day? The parking lot full of shoppers. The police station just across the street. Who could pull off such a crime and not leave a single clue behind? Adam Walsh was six years old when he was abducted on July 27th in 1981 from Sears at the Hollywood Mall. And sadly, Adam was found dead 16 days later. This is Adam in his Hollywood Optimist uniform. This photo was taken by Michael Hopkins of Berlinda's Photography. Berlinda's is still in Davie. And this photo is very popular. It was used in many missing persons alerts, newsreels, and the 5 by 7 original print um, is on file with the Hollywood Historical Society. Uh, Adam's father, John Walsh, probably most of you recognize John Walsh, became a very big advocate for change in how we handle cases of missing and exploited children. Uh, he helped launch the Missing Children Act of 1982, in which federal, state, and local governments, they were able to talk to each other better and communicate better on how they handled cases of missing and missing children. Before then, the systems really didn't talk to each other. I mean, you could find a missing bike or a car easier than a person. It's amazing to think about that to this point, but there really weren't things in place to do that, and he lobbied to have a system that did that. He also co-founded the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, 84, and um, helped launch the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act of 2006, which created the sex offender registry that we know today. A lot of things came from his advocacy. And of course, he um, started on this show on this new network called Fox in 1988, um, called America's Most Wanted, so we all know that show. And he currently um, is on the hunt with John Walsh on CNN. Another legacy of Adam Walsh is Code Adam. This was uh, started by Walmart in 1994. And keep in mind, this precedes at, um, Amber Alert. Amber Alert isn't until 1996. But Walmart takes it upon themselves to launch something where we can stop, everybody can stop to try to find a missing child. So what happens um, for stores that participate in Code Adam, the store goes on lockdown for 10 minutes. And for that time in the period, the description of the child you know, is announced throughout the store. No one goes in, no one goes out. And within that 10 minute period, hopefully the child is found. And if not, then after that 10 minute period, the authorities are notified right away. So um, it was uh, really instrumental in helping to launch something further like an Amber Alert. And when you go into stores, look at the doors when you go in. You're probably gonna see Code Adam and that's what that is. A lot of, a lot of stores participate in Code Adam. Uh, I was four. Four years old when this happened, just entering elementary school not too long after. And this was on a, a lot of our kid, kids' minds, of course, when we entered school. We, uh, it was very common to wear those shirts with the name on the back. You know, you had the iron on on the front of your favorite animal, your favorite musical group, whatever. And you pick the letters and you had them ironed on on the back. You probably got the shirt at Sears or Zare. Uh, but that stopped. You know, you really couldn't. You know, you, we were just a lot more um, attentive and vigilant to what people were capable of. So it definitely made us more aware and set the stage for the future for us. Now, um, in leaving the Hollywood Mall, I do want us to take a trip to the other mall, which is the Hollywood Fashion Center. Now, this is also not to be confused with the Fashion Mall at Plantation, which a lot of people would confuse it with that one as well. Now, this mall had four anchor stores. Do you guys remember the four anchor stores? I think I heard most of them. All right. Wait. Yeah. Who said that? Who said Richards? You of you. Very nice. <laughs> nice. Love it. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, these were the four anchor stores when it opened. Um, 
it goes back to 1972. Um, in the space of Richards, later we had Zare, and then Ames. And this mall was around from 72 to 93. Uh, other stores that I adored, and if any of you saw the pre-show, you probably saw Sam Goody on there a lot. The record store, love the record store, Sam Goody. Uh, Aladdin's Castle, the arcade, of course. And I think you guys can help me with this one. Did we have Orange Julius or the Orange Bowl? Orange Julius. Okay, thank you. I wasn't sure which one. What could we narrow that one down? Um, the Gap. Chess, King, Mary, around all those kind of early 90s stores that the kids liked. Now, this lasted, as I said, until 93 because probably Pembroke Lake Mall opens up. Um, in that space, we had Gordon Food Service for a while, the Millennium Mall, a few other things. What is it now, guys? Walmart. Walmart. It was open for a while as a flea market. Yes, that's right. Thank you. It was also flea market for a while. You got it. Now I have this nice aerial shot of how it um, used to be in 87. There's Burdines kind of per poking out there. It's hard to see. But to give you an idea, this is heading north now, down 441. And this little pink line that's going to come up is heading towards the beach. So just to kind of give you a visual of how big it was. Very, very nice big mall. Not as big as Sawgrass Mills, but it was plenty, plenty big. And across from the Hollywood Fashion Center, was Circus Playhouse. Yes. Circus, Circus Playhouse. <laughs> this minute right now is why I'm doing this. This is so exciting. <laughs> Just tell me about Circus Playhouse. So the Circus Playhouse, for those of you that don't know, um, all right, it was kind of like Dave and Buster's, but for kids. So. Like it's just, okay, thank you. I forgot about Chuck E. Cheese. It's just, it's Chuck E. Cheese. It's Chuck E. Cheese, but not as like, Cool. I mean, Chuck E. Cheese is a little bit more like corporate and probably a little bit better. Circus Playhouse was, you know, it was a little rough around the edges, but it was fun. Circus Playhouse was a cool place. And it had a merry-go-round in the place. A merry-go-round, so you can't beat that. If I close my eyes, I swear I can find myself around this place. The bathrooms were down here, the show was over here, animatronic show, you sat here, you ate your pizza, the pizza was always mediocre. But you didn't care because a robot brought it to you. <laughs> robot bringing pizza, you know, and your cake. If you had a birthday party there, which I think, I mean, mom, every year, every other year, I don't know. Yeah, it's just, and if you had a friend that was having it there, you went. And if somebody had a birthday party at a circus playhouse, you went. This was directly across from the Hollywood Fashion Center. Uh, there was a movie theater next door as well, so if you were the luckiest kid in the whole entire world, you saw a movie, and then you went to Zorka's Playhouse after the play some games, that would have been the best day ever. Um, this was around from about the early 80s to about the early 90s, and uh, I think it's a church now. I think the area is still there, yeah. And uh, if you are really missing Circus Playhouse, yes, find Chuck E. Cheese or go to Dave & Buster's. If you're an adult, you can have a beverage of your choice there, if you'd like. Okay, guys, we talked about the dry bread at Christmas House and how they had to move, sadly, right? Because they lost that space to, to park and they needed a lot more space. Well, what they found um, was this great space on Sterling and 441 on the northwest corner. 22 acres, to be exact, they were able to lease the land from the Seminole Indians. With this space, they could make it a theme park. Magical Village, you paid five bucks, you got in, it was all you can ride. They were able to go from 130,000 lights to a million lights. It was, it was amazing. Oh my gosh, Magical Village. And it, it lasted in that location from about 89 to about 98. And um, the thing was, is at that time they had to move somewhere else because the Seminoles couldn't renew the lease because they had some plans <laughs> for, for the space. <laughs> yeah, here's where the, here, here were the plans. <laughs> they wanted to build a building that would um, become the Hard Rock. But Magical Village had a great run in that location. They moved over to near Grand Prix for a while, kind of near Sterling. 
And um, I think they also were kind of near where the fashion center was for a very small amount of time. And um, sadly, they no longer uh, do anything. But Santa's Magical Village had, a, had its moment for sure. All right, guys, uh, let's go skating. <laughs> All right, I'm a Hollywood kid. I went skating a lot. And yes, I went skating in Davy at Galaxy. <laughs> I think I missed the skating rink that we had in Hollywood for a while. I know there was one, I think somewhere off Johnson. Yes. yes. Oh gosh, that would've been great. <laughs> well, Galaxy's been around a long time. Galaxy's been around since 76. It's still there. Uh, here's a nice shot of the inside of Galaxy. It's, uh, again, skating. Arcade, had an arcade back then, and uh, I have um, great memories of going there. It's uh, on Davy Road Extension, just south of Sterling. And if you really want to get your feel of how it was to skate back in the day, they do a flashback Thursday's night. <laughs> Miami Bass, freestyle 70s, 80s, if anyone's up for it. Again, see me after. We'll go to the speakeasy, then we'll go here. <laughs> Sounds like a really good time. <laughs> Galaxy, uh, was definitely uh, good memories, good memories for us kids, and then even up until today, I still see everyone enjoying it with families, friends, they have so many theme nights. So if you haven't been to Galaxy, um, just to kind of do a little mini shout out for Davey, I guess, go to Galaxy. <laughs> so between, see now we're kind of near university. Between university and Flamingo, to be quite honest, when I was growing up, I don't remember a whole lot. The only thing I remember between University and Flamingo as a kid was cows. Bell South. Cows. That, or Southern cows. was it? Yeah, cows. That's it. That's da it. Dairy farms. Dairy farms. That's it. Yes. I think we would go there to, to switch out the phone that we rented for $8 a month. Yes. Why did we? Everybody did that back then. You rented That's your right. phone. That's what you did. Yeah, you rented your phone and. <laughs> They you switched, do, they rebuilt it, it was wonder. You stretched out the cord long enough and you said, let's just get a new phone and you you drove way out west. I think it was right around maybe Douglas-ish. It's, it's, it's still there. It's still, it's still there. there. That's right. It's it is still, still there. there. So there was nothing, nothing, nothing. Southern Bell. Nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> and then this is where I usually ended up. At C.B. Smith Park. Well, for a kid, again, big deal at C.B. Smith Park. And I have to say, in terms of cutting this presentation, it tortured me to not put T.Y. Park in here, so please, mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> but if I had to make a choice, it was only to kind of keep us as west as I could to get us further west. So, uh, C.B. Smith Park, named for Charlie Barney Smith, Hollywood pioneer, former Broward County Commissioner, City of Hollywood Commissioner, and he championed for the cause of public land for parks. So it sounded like C.B. certainly did his job. This was a great park. It had a nice beach, still has, I shouldn't say had. Uh, water slides, um, C.B. Smith Park goes all the way back to 1982, and it's still here. It has a driving range now, it's, it's really expanded. C.B. Smith Park is, is just huge. If you're not sure exactly where C.B. Smith Park is, it's um, at Flamingo, and when Hollywood Boulevard changes over, it turns, of course, into Pines Boulevard. So Pines Boulevard and Flamingo Road. And if you ask State Farm Insurance in 2001, they will tell you, remember this Heather, it's the most dangerous intersection in the United States. It was voted, Flamingo and Pines. And you can kind of see why in terms of commuting, everyone leaving Miami-Dade in the morning and everyone heading to Miami-Dade, that thoroughfare, forget it. You can just see in pure numbers just how that would be. All right, guys, so I just have one question for you. But I'm going to lower my volume before I ask you, because I don't want to take anybody too off guard. In 1982, 
right before a Van Halen concert. See how nice and clean it is? <laughs> <laughs> now, so roughly, and we'll talk about the location a lot more, but if you had to put, a, put it on the map right now, it's roughly at Pines Boulevard and 171st. So, way out west. Because we're roughly at what now? 19? 26. 20, I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. 26. So just, you just keep going to 171. You just keep going, keep going. I have um, a nice aerial shot here. Here's an aerial shot. You're looking north in this shot. And just to kind of tie in all that we've put together so far, just, um, just to um, the east here was also the uh, Hollywood, Miami, I'm sorry, the Miami Hollywood Motorsports Park where they did a lot of the drag racing. Um, get this, John Walsh, he moved to Hollywood after going to college in New York in 1965, got a job at the Diplomat as a cabana boy and would race here at Hollywood Motorsports Park. <laughs> Crazy tie-in, I couldn't believe it. I was so excited when I found all that. So let me ask you just by looking at this, does this place look like much to you? Yeah. Uh, well, large. You should, you shouldn't judge it by its cover, but in the case of the Sportatorium, it's kind of a warning. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of a warning of what's inside. It had a lot of nicknames, and not cute ones like AAA, like American Airlines Arena, or um, it was National Car Rental Center, the Nickrick, it's now BB&T. No, the, triple, um, the Sportatorium was called things like <laughs> the vomitorium, <laughs> pitatorium, I will not even say this one out loud, snoratorium, <laughs> ugly shack, come on, the barn, the barn for sure. Yes, yeah, that's one I remember. Sure. Yeah. 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 The Sporto, uh, that was the one. I like the Sporto. That was yeah. a good one. Sporto's a cute yeah. name for sure. Those other ones I never heard of. Those. I've seen it, but I've never heard of them. Yeah, the Sportatorium definitely has a, a mixed love hate <laughs> history with everyone. Um, now, there's also, along with all of these nicknames, a lot of interesting quotations that both fans and artists have accumulated through the years. My favorite quotation, and I found a lot of them, but if I had to pick my favorite one, it was from a, a Sun Sentinel rock critic named Scott Bernardi. He said, and I quote, it was the best place to be and it was the worst place to be. <laughs> I love that. Some other cool quotes I found, um, Roger Waters of Pink Floyd, he called this place a real compromise. <laughs> Some attendees called it lawless. Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin, he called this the first gig that was rained out inside. <laughs> <laughs> that guy, um, Bernardi, that I like, another quote from him, enough smoke to cure a ton of salmon for a year. <laughs> another concert <laughs> said it's nothing but a big joke. Another one said it's an act of charity to say the sportatorium was acoustically challenged. <laughs> an eyesore, an antiquated, ugly, obsolete building. And Billy Joel, he agreed the sound system was bad. He called it an acoustical nightmare. But probably my favorite Billy Joel quote was this one. <laughs> Blank the traffic getting to this place. <laughs> but let's face it, right? Getting there is half the fun. <laughs> so here's Hollywood Boulevard as a two-lane road. Imagine that, right? Did you all experience it like 30 minutes ago? Because it's in it <laughs> like that now under construction. <laughs> Imagine it like that getting to a concert. In the dark. In the dark. Oh. So up until 1985, Hollywood Boulevard is a two-lane road for eight miles west of the Turnpike. Traffic is backing up all the way to the Turnpike, getting to the Sportatorium. People have cars that are overheating. I mean, remember, this is like 70s, 80s. These cars are not great yet. They're not efficient. Cars are overheating. People are wild. They're just getting out and tailgating, too. They just stop, get out, tailgate. 
Someone, somebody will get out and walk. Friend will pick him up down the road. Wow. There was one story where a guy got out, went to like a restaurant, got a sandwich, ate it, and by the time the friend like met up with him, he was, he, he like met, like it took him basically longer to like drive there than the guy to eat the sandwich or something. It's, it was really, really bad. So the city's aware of this, the county, the state, whoever does the road. So what they do is they widen a part of it, right? They widen a four mile stretch of the road from University to Flamingo. <coughs> Sounds good, right? But there's four miles remaining after Flamingo. So it doesn't help a whole lot. Helps a little bit, but not a lot. So the thing is, if you've ever been to any concert or sporting event, you just know how bad traffic is. Just imagine a two-lane road like this. I mean, it's just hours. I feel like even when we went in the 80s, it was three, four hours. I mean, it was, just, it was horrible. But Say it's 1976 now, like this picture, right? And let's consider, just for fun, all of the roads that we have today, all the main thoroughfares, right? What do we got? Here's what we got. So getting to the sportatorium, are we taking the turnpike? Well, it's a pain, right? We don't want to take the turnpike. We already know we're going to be in traffic for hours and hours and hours. No, we're not taking the turnpike. Why don't we just get on I-75? There. Thank you. That's not 1986 yet. We can't do it. Sawgrass? No. Not there. Not there yet. 1986 is when Sawgrass comes about. 595? No. Not until 1990. We can't take it. How about State Road 84? That's interesting. So here's the thing. We, it doesn't go all the way here. We can take it. Pretty west, we could take it to US 27. We could take it that far, and if we cut over on US 27, we could come in this back way that, let's face it, not a lot of people knew they could do because word of mouth was just word of mouth then. You couldn't really look it up or go on ways or whatever we do now. That's how we leave. You're kidding, nice. Yeah, we go punch, we go punch. Go out the other way. Go out the other way. Very cool, very cool. So it was good. For those people that figured that out, they pretty much made it. Now, I could pretty much tell you how it was, but I have a video showing you. Oh, no. 1976 traffic. Want to see it? Yeah. I'm at the sportatorium. Let's see how it was, guys. Whoever coined the term impatient you obviously never attended a rock concert at the sportatorium. Thousands of young drivers seem perfectly willing to face hours-long traffic snarls both before and after the arena's opening night performance. Good-natured police kept good-natured young drivers from going bananas, and while the cars often slowed to a crawl, they did usually keep moving. Some of the more athletically inclined parked miles away along the shoulders of Hollywood Boulevard. All of the parking area planned for the sportatorium has not yet been finished. For those who wonder when this two-lane road will be widened, the State Department of Transportation has not yet put it on its priority list. Those who thought they'd avoid the traffic jam by coming early for the 8 o'clock performance caused their own snarl up from 4.30 to 5.30. And who was it that inspired this display of patience and perseverance? ZZ Top, a three-man multi-animal rock group that puts out its own unique brand of hard rock, Texas style. Just in case anyone has any doubts about where they're from, they cart along a 40-ton stage in the shape of the Lone Star State and several of its beastly trademarks. In addition to rattlesnakes, buzzards, a 2,500-pound buffalo named Tex, what else? There's a 2,200-pound longhorn steer named Texas. Well, you didn't expect them to call it that, did you? While many of these youthful rock band's parents have never even heard of ZZ Top, the group has been packing them into stadiums around the country this summer, often drawing more than 50,000 to their lavishly produced performances. The sound system was practically loud enough to test the structural strength of the completely refurbished entertainment sports facility, now the largest in South Florida. The tremendous amount of smoke produced by the 16,000 plus audience was kept moving by a huge air conditioning system, froze some of sat near its vents, but the overall effect wasn't so drastic. This, of course, was opening night, and Sportatorium Manager Bruce Johnson says he discovered a lot of things that can easily be improved upon for future performances. He was pleased with the 
crowd, the group's performance, and the way his long time coming arena held up under its opening night test. The fact that ZZ Top sold out this 16,000 seat performance a week in advance should prove that the Sportatorium can make a lot of money on rock concerts. It may just be they won't miss those hockey and basketball franchises as much as everyone thought. Kerry Millerick, Channel 4 News. Let's have those lighters too. You go. Did we, did we miss those hockey and basketball franchises? No. Not really. <laughs> Not really. All right, folks. So yes, that is certainly how it was. So you're driving there, right? You make it through all this crazy traffic. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. You see an old woman came really It's because my son turned 16. In 1971, I had a driver's license. And wanted to go to a garage for concerts by himself. <laughs> 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 oh, let me let me tell you, that place, it's funny what it did to people. It was just one of those places that you had to you had to get to. It's like this rock mecca. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, Stacy, what were the years that it was open? Oh, I think I had that somewhere. I'm sorry. I don't know right offhand. Okay. I will get that for you at the end if I don't mention it by then. So here's a shot of the Sportatorium from the outside. And it looks like a cold day in Florida, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And they're lining up to see a pretty uh, big star. I think somebody here was there. Karen. Elvis Presley. Wow. They're lining up here to buy tickets on 77. Uh, second to the last concert. Second to last concert he had? Before he died. Before he died. So good thing Karen went. From here to Wow. I didn't know it personally, but it was this little chunky. Yeah, he's a little, uh, a little chunky, yeah. So, oh. That was good. But think about that for a minute. This place that looks like it does, and Elvis is performing there. It's like, <laughs> why? Well, it's, it seats a lot of people. 16,000 people. Now, let me put this in perspective for you. We also have Sunrise Musical Theater at the time, which seats 3,700. So if that, think of that jump, 3,700 and Sportatorium, 16,000 people. You're Elvis, you're going to Sportatorium. Or no matter how disgusting it is, or how, you're going to Sportatorium. Well, um, there were a lot of huge acts there. I saw my first concert there, Brian Adams, opening <coughs> Scandal, Patti Smythe. Oh my gosh, it was a great concert. Probably a few more after, but you never forget your first concert. A lot of other acts performed there that were huge. This is just a sampling, just a sampling, of who performed there in the 80s. Fleetwood Mac, Neil Diamond, wow. Elton Rogers, John. No stones. stones. We saw <laughs> Kenny Rogers. A lot of they were all probably there, yeah. Huge, just huge, huge acts were there. Um, I got in touch with a photographer. I don't think he's here today, Larry Singer. So Larry had some, He's a photographer that does a lot, he follows a lot of bands and takes great close-up photography um, at a lot of venues. And he's local, so he has a lot of great photos from the Hollywood Sportatorium. And I said, give me everything you have from the Hollywood Sportatorium, please. So I'd like to show you a few um, photos that were taken at the Sportatorium. And also, these are folks that performed there in the 80s. Here's the first one. Cronin, lead singer for Ario Speedwagon. And who else was there? This and another big one we had one year later was The Boss. The Boss. ended up really hating the Sportatorium because he was playing a very nice quiet ballad one day. Uh, it was called Independence Day, the song Independence Day. 
and somebody decides to start setting off firecrackers. I mean, the song is not about the 4th of July, it's about something a lot deeper than that. But someone starts setting off firecrackers, and Springsteen, and I have to edit this, I'm sorry for the group, but he stops the show and he says, I want whoever did that to go back to the box office, get their money back, and never come back to one of my shows again. So several fans, they started pulling off this very impressive act of urinating on the stage from the front row. Wow. And Springsteen makes a promise to never play the Sportatorium ever again. And he did it. He did it. He never came back to the Sportatorium. So uh, it was definitely a rough place. But we got a lot of really big people. We also um, got this guy. Uh in 77 and then we got <laughs> Cat Scratch Fever came and later joined that super group Damn Yankees and this is a shot of Ted Nugent with his daughter Sasha um, this was another shot taken by the photographer with uh, Bob Seger interestingly enough and then the photographer got this shot of Ted Nugent with his daughter and framed it and gave it to him when he came back with his son. I just kind of, I always love that touch when I see that. Um, now Ted Nugent, no stranger to controversy, he had a, he was a part of a big riot at the Sportatorium, one of the few big riots at the Sportatorium. Uh, this was a really big one. 500 people got sent to the hospital at a Ted Nugent concert at the Sportatorium. It was wild. I know, this one was in 1980. There probably were some, a few after. Um, the band Rush in 1981, another big, big riot because probably my favorite dr drummer, Neil Peart, he was watching a baseball game. He really wanted to see the end of that baseball game, so he insisted on waiting, and the concert did not start on time. The fans got really upset. They started rushing the place. Uh, the police had to use tear gas, throwing the, band, the fans started throwing rocks, bottles, and 11 police officers got injured at that riot. So the Sportatorium, again, lawless, truly lawless. So folks, we're starting to kind of wrap down now, and I want to start my close with a, a three minute video. This was a little bit longer, but it kind of encapsulates everything. It's, it's really well done. It was done by the Sun Sentinel and it shows you the legacy of the Sportatorium, and it shows you exactly where it once stood, exactly. So enjoy this, and we'll talk a little bit about the closing. You know and I know everything happens in South Florida, and in the 1970s and 80s, the Hollywood Sportatorium was where it was happening. I'm Wayne Rooston with another chapter of South Florida's dubious history. Long before there was a AAA or a BB&T or even the Miami Arena, there was the Hollywood Sportatorium. It was built in 1969 by developer Stephen Calder of Calder Racecourse and Gulf Ocean Mile fame and promoter Norman Johnson, who created the Miami Pop Music Festival and co-owned the Miami Hollywood Motorsports Park. It occupied nearly 240 acres of land in the middle of nowhere. West Hollywood Boulevard was only two lanes back then, which created monumental traffic jams. The Sportatorium was the only venue for big entertainment events, ranging from heavyweight boxing and wrestling to rodeos and motorcycle racing. The Sportatorium was designed to be home to a professional hockey or basketball team. In fact, there were four different attempts to bring a team to South Florida. This is the jersey of the first franchise attempt, the Miami Screaming Eagles, autographed by Bernie Parrott, the Philadelphia Flyers Hall of Fame goaltender that the WHA tried to lure from the NHL to legitimize the league. Unfortunately, the Screaming Eagles never got off the ground, partly because the Sportatorium was unsuitable for hockey. It may have failed as a sports arena, but it thrived as a concert hall. Rob Williams endured about two dozen concerts in the smoke-filled, non-air-conditioned, asphalt-floored sweat box, and he kept going back for more. You know, it was good old dirty rock and roll, you know, the yeah. dirt, broken down place out in the middle of nowhere, and you can be loud as you want, and we didn't have to shut down at 11 p.m. because of noise ordinance, and uh, if, the, if the band wanted to come out for a third encore, they could. 
The Sportatorium was located right here at 17171 West Hollywood Boulevard at the time. Now it's Pines Boulevard, and this is a Sedano supermarket. We've got a sprawling housing development to the north. As a concert hall, it had a leaky metal roof, lousy acoustics, and the stage was right about here, appropriately enough. <laughs> Despite that, it attracted all the biggest acts of the day, including Elvis Presley. People stood in line for hours to get tickets. It's a good thing they did. Six months later, he would be dead. The Sportatorium would die too. It closed in 1988 after the Sunrise Musical Theater and Miami Arena came along. It was torn down in 1993 to make way for more than a thousand homes and a shopping center in what was, by then, Pembroke Pines. Sensible, practical, but not nearly as cool. With another chapter in South Florida's dubious history, I'm Wayne Rooston for the Sun Sentinel. <laughs> You can really go to the rock mecca. You can stand right by the lovable dump. Right there. Like you're on stage. It's amazing. I love it. All right, folks. So, you might be wondering, where do I go to learn more, right? Doesn't shouldn't have to stop here. Well, we have a research center at the Hollywood Historical Society. It's on Polk Street. Um, see any of us today or myself, if you don't know exactly where it is, I'd be happy to tell you and I'll also run our website at the end of this. I did a lot of my research there. We have really cool drawers of information, photos, newsletter articles. Make an appointment, come and see us. We have tons of information there. And we also have the Sun Tatler binders. If you're wondering where those are, we have them. The Sun Tatler. Um, also, when is our next event? Well, it's January 14th. We have this really cool talk. I'm gonna get the exact title. Why do you love that old bag? 100 years of handbag styles and designers. This will be by Shelley DeMarco of the Hollywood Women's Club. And um, as Karen mentioned, this is gonna be our lecture series in 2018. This is not gonna be at this library, it's gonna be at the Sterling Road Library. But um, I do hope that you can become a member to hear about future events uh, like that one. So come to that event. If you can't wait till that event, Go to the, you're in a library, you can get information now. Go to the 900 section, it's history. I know that because I used to work in a library and I'm a history nerd. Just go to the 900s. If you can't even wait to get to the 900s, see Joan, she's selling books. <laughs> you can get a book right now if you'd like. Um, I mean, come on, the holidays are coming. What would make a great gift? Like a coffee table book for your Hollywood history lover. Also, um, how can you see more stuff like this? Remember, we can bring this presentation anywhere. I just recently did this for a church group. Um, I may do it for another community group soon. I'd love to bring this to anybody. If you know anybody who may be interested, uh, we could do a church, birthdays, weddings, mitzvahs, like, whatever you like, we can do it. But become a member. That, that was the easiest way. Um, our membership fee is not a lot. We have membership forms in the back. And um, as always, if you would like, we do welcome donations, um, cash, check, and we are also on PayPal. PayPal.com slash give now. Look up Hollywood Historical Society. We'll be there. All right, folks, so before I truly close out, um, I do want to take maybe, I don't know if we have time for questions or we should do that informally later. Was that, is that easier for us? Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we truly wrap up? Yes, ma'am. And if you go to the Publix, I still more park. The receipt still says Hollywood Mall. Wow. Yeah. Oh, neat. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. It still says Hollywood Mall. I love it. Yes. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see how you notice it. Thank you. And Hollywood. We'll have to all go to shopping in there. Just something. Yes. Get one of those before they notice. <laughs>